Good evening and welcome to Sankalp's main stage event for 2022. My name is Urvashi Devidyal and I lead Sankalp India. This evening we have two very interesting discussions on areas that are of critical importance that need more attention. The first is on affordable housing and the second on women entrepreneurs and climate change. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the moderator for this evening, Ajita Shashidhar, editor at Large Fortune India. Thank you for joining us, Ajita. Thank we'll you, Urvashi. We will start this evening off with a conversation between Ajita and Louis Noda. Louis is the Vice President, Asia Pacific Habitat for Humanity. Thank you for joining us, Louis. Sure, this thank you. This discussion will be on affordable housing at the center of sustainable impact. Ajita, over to you. Thank you, Urvashi. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be part of the Sankal Global Summit 2022 and an absolute privilege to do this chat with Mr. Louis Noda. Having a roof over one's head is a basic human right, but not everyone is lucky enough. More than 1.8 billion, according to a United Nations report, do not have adequate housing, including, which includes 1 billion people living in informal settlements. And this number is unfortunately on the rise. The United Nations projects that by 2030, roughly 3 billion people will require adequate, affordable housing. So Lewis, I'm told that access to adequate and affordable housing is one of the few UN SDG goals, which is showing a regression. Affordable housing is clearly a challenge in both developed as well as emerging economies. Why and how is affordable housing important in transforming impact? Thank you very much, Ajita, for the call. And thank you for the organizers of Sun Carpets Conference. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with all of you. Um, it is important, uh, you know, affordable housing, and especially there's a, a SDG, a Sustainable Development Goal, Goal 11, that talks about making cities and human settlements inclusive, uh, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Uh, and it talks about as well, uh, reducing the proportion of people in urban settings uh, uh, that are living in slums and informal settlements. Uh, you know, the, the, the area of affordable housing, the, the area of adequate housing permeates all of their areas related to development. Um, you know, it's connected to health. It is connected to livelihoods. It's connected to the sense of security. It is connected as well with the possibility of having a space that's conducive for education, for child education, for adult education, and so on. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's very important in the sense that it connects many areas of life into the well-being and the development of people. Therefore, the access to affordable housing, the access to adequate housing, it's a priority. And as you have said before in the introduction of your question, we are seeing a regression on the progress that has been achieved on the Sustainable Development Goal 11. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of the handful indicators of the Sustainable Development Goals that are actually regressing and we are concerned that this is going to continue in the following years as a consequence of the impact of COVID-19, the impact of the economic, uh, you know, uh, repercussions that it had. And now with the conflicts that we are seeing in the world, uh, with the spike of inflation and, you know, economic turmoil in, in different locations. Uh, so we are concerned that, you know, 3 billion people uh, will we'll not have access to adequate housing by, by the beginning of the new decade. So uh, all to say that for us is crucial, therefore the importance of the topic of adequate housing and affordable housing. Interesting. Uh, so climate change and natural calamities have become a way of life today. Um, each time there's a flood or a hurricane in any country, thousands of people lose their homes. So how can we address the housing needs of these 1.8 billion, which is likely to grow to 3 billion uh, by 2030 uh, in a sustainable way? Uh, I think that there are multiple things that we can do. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, you know, the recognition at the society level, at the government level and so on, that shelter is, is, is critical. 
maintaining good shelter, maintaining adequate housing for the population in the countries where we are located in every place is critical for the well-being of people. And uh, we know that climate change is associated with, with radical climates or extreme climate. And we are seeing an increase on typhoons, floods, earthquakes, uh, natural disasters that are a, as a, cons- are, are a consequence of, of the increase of the temperature in, uh, on our planet, uh, or sorry, in our planet. And this, you know, extreme weather is definitely impacting the poor more than anyone else. Um, and we see that, you know, because the constructions that people have, especially in informal settlements and so on, uh, are not according to standard. And these uh, families are the first ones to, you know, fault victim in the case of natural disasters. So there are several, several things that we can do. First of all, as I said, is the acknowledging the importance of the topic. A second thing that we can do is increasing the level of innovations that we can pour into the affordable housing, adequate housing part, so that you know families could have that resilience and strength in their houses that they built uh, so that they can withstand these catastrophes that are becoming more and more common. Uh, and then the other thing that we can do as, as well is you know work uh, in partnerships uh, in order to strengthen the approach uh, on reducing the level of impact, uh, but, you know, and promoting a sustainable consumption, sustainable production. Um, definitely climate change is challenging the way that we as humans have been living in the past uh, at least three centuries or two centuries. So there's a significant mind shift that needs to happen, not only among people that are living in informal settlements and so on, but all of us, uh, so that we can be part of the solution. Uh, and as I said, you know, uh, we, uh, Habitat, we partner with families to be a stronger, uh, more resilient uh, homes against uh, natural disasters. And that's a contribution that we continue, you know, uh, looking to provide in the sector where we are working. Uh, it'll be interesting if you could share some examples of the kind of partnerships you're doing and also moving on from there, uh, it would also be interesting to hear from you about the kind of innovations that are happening in the space. Uh, are, uh, are innovations, up, are the innovations really up to the mark? Are there any, um, you know, improvements that need to be made there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's a very good question. In India, for example, uh, through Habitat Ster Williger Center for Innovation in Shelter, we partner with startups, uh, you know, like uh, Rematerials is one of them to support them in taking their existing products and services so that they can go into the market uh, and serve, uh, you know, families uh, in the affordable housing part so that they can improve the quality of their housing. Um, we have a shelter venture fund in India and Habitat invests in rematerials and in its products. Uh, you know, there's one product that they launch, which is called Modroof, a modular roofing system for the slums and villages. Um, and uh, this could be applied as well to schools, hospitals and other infrastructure. And the main component of the roofing is a system uh, that is based on panels that are custom manufacture uh, from packaging and agricultural waste. So the mud roof panels are strong, are durable, are fireproof and long lasting. And they compete in the market and it's low cost and easy to install. So the roof panels are creating, you know, th- are created through materials that are 90% in the recyclability of their capacity. And, you know, it has a long lifespan. So these panels have a high reflective index as well, contributing to the reduction of heat inside the house. And this, you know, preserves energy and so on, and reduces the, you know, that absorbing capacity, as I mentioned, and makes, you know, the houses uh, cooler during the summer. This is one example of a simple innovation that could be applied in one part of the house 
that could contribute, uh, you know, to the well-being of the family, to the security of the family, and as well as, you know, contributing to the reduction of consumption of energy and so on, and, you know, goes along to all of the necessary measures that we have to implement or the multiple measures that we have to implement in order to reduce our footprint uh, in our planet, our carbon footprint in the planet. So can this, I mean, can this form of housing be replicated across the country, across climates? Because in India, we have varied climates uh, in different parts of the country. So is this kind of, uh, uh, can, can it be replicated through the, all over the country? Or is it only suitable to a certain climate? It's, it's been replicated in the areas uh, where the climate is, is warmer and so on. But, you know, it can be installed in different other locations, of course. You know, one of the big characteristics of this type of roofing is the cooling system that it provides or the, you know, natural cooling that provides the houses. But it can be uh, uh, the same, you know, uh, installed in other locations. I know how, how big or, you know, how big of a continent India is by itself, right? So uh, multiple settings, ecological regions and so on. Uh, but this is one example, you know, that could be scaled and it's in the process of being scaled up through market. And how economical is it? Um, it competes with the current, uh, you know, the, the the conventional technology that we have, and it's definitely much more um, competitive in terms of quality and so on. With the very temporary infrastructures that are put for rock roofing that normally, you know, leak during the, the rainy season and so on, and it adds up into the vulnerability of the families and the households that leave over there. So one last question, what would be your advice uh, to an early stage entrepreneur who's looking at foraying into uh, affordable housing for the underprivileged? What would be your advice? What, what, what can they take away from this discussion? Yeah, well, let me tell you that, for example, in India, 30% of the urban population uh, is living in substandard housing, right? So uh, these families do not need only a new and improvement house, uh, you know, a whole new house, but they, they also need uh, practical solutions uh, for things that, that they are dealing with on a daily basis in terms of affordable water, sanitation units. The studies uh, are reflecting that, for example, by improvements in the flooring uh, of the house or the roofing, can do a lot in terms of improving the quality of those families. Uh, the other thing that we have to, uh, uh, as well as knowledge, acknowledge, is among you know families that are lower in income, uh, the construction of houses take uh, place through years. So we call it incremental construction, right? No, in, especially in 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 neighborhoods where you know the majority of the population have a lower income they don't build up a house from one day to the other or in a couple of months sometimes it takes decades for them to complete that house so uh, that's another sector that it's uh, relatively attractive uh, very attractive for innovation so for young entrepreneurs, for people that are willing to innovate and contribute, uh, you know, to increasing adequate housing in our population, this is a, a market uh, that it's potential uh, for development. So, you know, thinking about access, thinking about windows, thinking about roofing, flooring, thinking about better technology for walls, isolation, uh, insulation, sorry, and all of those things, provision of water, are areas of innovation that can be tapped on. And I just want to mention one more thing is that as we as Habitat for Humanity, we developed initiatives like, for example, the Shelter Tech, which is the world's leading platform for affordable, affordable housing innovation. And we have been supporting you know, these entrepreneurs in their development of their, their ideas and connecting them with, you know, influencers, coaches, and so on, as well as funding. So, so far, we have been supporting more than 70 startups across four continents. You know, this is around the world, and one of the shelters is located in India. Uh, and one example, another example is uh, this company that is called Tavasta, that is working on the 3D printing for houses. And they are in the process of scaling up that option. And right now they are in connections 
with different sectors within the Indian context so that they can scale up that technology. So I just want to say that uh, there's huge potential in this area of affordable housing, adequate housing, and especially if we connect these ideas with the concept of incremental building that families practice. Thank you so much, Louis. It was a pleasure talking to you and hugely insightful. Thank you so much.